Hey guys, the History Guy here coming to you uh, on location, 14 miles upriver from the city of Johnstown, Pennsylvania. And I'm standing on what remains of what was known as the South Fork Dam. Uh, the construction on a dam uh, in this valley had begun as early as the 1830s, but uh, because of lack of funds was not completed for a couple of decades. And in the 1850s, the dam was finally completed. And so this entire area behind me was all a reservoir. It was under about 65 to 70 feet of water. And over time, uh, Johnstown being uh, just outside of the city of Pittsburgh, it's uh, maybe an hour, hour and a half away from Pittsburgh, uh, a lot of the, um, the wealthiest members of Pittsburgh society, including people like Andrew Carnegie, uh, the steel magnates, would come here to a place that became known as the South Fork uh, Hunting and Fishing Club and they would come here to get away from the city, to get away from life, it was a vacation spot. Uh, there was a lodge up on the shore. Uh, there was fishing and hunting that could be done. They had put thousands of fish into the reservoir and uh, it was just a, a, a spot that many people came to. But what happened was over the, the decades, the dam, which was largely built of earth, it was uh, 70 feet high, about 900 feet across from where I'm standing to the other side behind me and about 500 feet thick at the base and then it narrowed as it got toward the top. It was mostly made of earth. There were some other materials as well. And uh, there was originally some pipes laid at the bottom and uh, some different things built in to allow a spillway, to allow water to get through if there was a lot of rain uh, because they knew that with an earthen dam, if the water would rise above the level of the dam and start to spill over, it would erode the dam and that would cause a disaster. And that had happened a few times on a minor scale. There had been some breaches in the dam and one of the things that eventually led to the disaster was that those breaches were filled in uh, in an improper way. The, the proper maintenance was not done. Uh, they would just throw in some gravel and rocks and things like that, things that were not really meant to hold back the water. And so by the time 1889 rolled around, the dam was in a state of severe disrepair. Some of the things down near the bottom, the pipes and area underneath the dam had all been filled in and had been left to uh, no longer be used. Uh, a grate had been placed, as I'll talk to you about, from the bottom uh, that eventually got jammed. And uh, so it was a recipe for disaster. And many people ended up blaming people like Andrew Carnegie for the disaster because the the people who controlled this area, the people whose money made this area possible, did not uh, put the proper attention and finances into maintaining the dam properly. Starting about the, the middle of the American Civil War, this dam was largely abandoned uh, in the mid-1860s, and it fell into a, a state of disrepair. And for 17 years, nothing was done to this dam. Uh, at the end of that 17 years, by uh, right around 1880, is when it was purchased by what became known as the South, uh, South Park Hunting and Fishing Club. Uh, they did some minor patches to it, but nothing... Uh, on the scale of what should have been done. They just kind of patched it up so that they could turn this into a, a hunting and fishing resort. And so by May of 1889, uh, the dam was once again uh, largely neglected and the people of the, the, the hunting and fishing resort had hired a recent uh, college graduate by the name of John Park, who was a uh, civil engineer, uh, to come here with a group of Italian immigrants and dig a sewer system for the club. And so they happened to be here doing the sewer system when it began to rain. 
and it continued to rain. And over the span of about 24 hours, somewhere between six and 10 inches of rain fell. And it got to the point where this reservoir, which was already only a few feet short of the top of the dam, began to rise about a foot an hour. And John Park, who was here to build a sewer system, uh, started riding back and forth across the dam on his horse, inspecting it, and he knew, he knew a disaster was coming, and he desperately tried to do something, anything at all, to stop it. And so he got all these Italian immigrants who were there to help him build the sewer system. They were sleeping in tents. And he grabbed them and got their picks and their shovels and had them desperately doing whatever they could to try and shore up the dam against this rising water. But they knew that if this dam gave way, that the, the valley below, all the way down to the city of Johnstown, uh, 14 miles away, uh, that it was going to be disaster and it was going to kill a lot of people. And he knew that and he did all he could to try and stop it. But unfortunately, his very best efforts were not enough. So I'm standing now uh, down in the bottom of uh, what was once the reservoir that uh, was created by the dam that existed uh, in the latter half of the 19th century here 14 miles upriver from Johnstown. Uh, at the time, I would have been under about 65 to 70 feet of water where I'm standing right now. Uh, the dam was just behind me, it was 70 feet high, and so it only allowed for just a few feet uh, of uh, rising from the reservoir and the water would spill over and so there was created uh, in the dam a an iron grate that allowed water to get through but not much else because uh, because of the hunting and fishing club that was here uh, they didn't want the fish to get out they had put uh, I think a thousand fish uh, in here a decade or so before as part of the hunting and fishing club and they didn't want the fish to escape downstream and so they put that iron grate and it was really small holes that allowed water through but nothing else. And so when the water began to rise uh, before the flood happened, debris had plugged that and they were desperately trying to remove that grate uh, to allow more water to flow through because they knew that if water rose over the dam, it would erode the dam and it would cause the disaster that un uh, eventually unfolded. And so a lot of people who suffered uh, loss of family members or of property as a result of the dam blamed those fish for the disaster that unfolded. So where I'm standing now is I'm now on the opposite side of the dam, or what's left of it. And I'm standing on a bridge that is over top of where the spillway once existed. Now you can see behind me uh, where I was standing before is the other side. And uh, so here is where all the water would flow. Uh, as the water built up and formed the reservoir, the excess water would flow over this spillway and continue down uh, downstream toward the city of Johnstown. Well, the, the uh, spillway was uh, only one uh, part of what was supposed to keep the water from overflowing the dam. The other part was over on the other side, there were some pipes that were supposed to be running underneath the dam. And there was a tower 
that had valves that allowed control of how much water flowed through those pipes. So between the pipes and the spillway, they were supposed to keep the water from overflowing the dam because earthen dams are good unless water flows over them. Once water flows over the top of those dams, it erodes and they collapse. Well, sometime before 1889, the, uh, the tower that controlled the water flowing through the pipes had burned down and never been replaced. Those pipes were eventually abandoned, and so the spillway became the only way to control water flowing uh, out of the reservoir. Because of all the rain that happened in May of 1889, the tributaries that fed this reservoir eventually picked up trees that had been uprooted, debris off the shore, and that all flowed into the reservoir and eventually clogged this spillway to the point where water was not flowing over fast enough. And that eventually directly led to the cause of the overflow of water and eventually of the flood itself. So in the end, uh, the unfortunate did happen. The water spilled over the top of the dam. It eroded the dam. The dam collapsed and water began to flow downstream in massive, massive amounts, picking up debris along the way. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to some of the locations that were affected by the collapse of the dam. But let's talk for a minute about what caused the, the flood. What were the causes? What were the reasons? Well, number one was neglect. Uh, this actually had been an, a well-engineered, well-built dam when it was completed in the 1850s. But all of the things that had been put into place, things like the spillway, uh, things like the, uh, the valves and the pipe system, uh, which all could have prevented this disaster, had been neglected. Uh, th with the burning of the tower and the eventual closing of those pipes, uh, leaving everything up to the spillway, uh, putting in a grate, that allowed water to flow through, but didn't allow the debris to flow through and uh, cause that to get blocked up, put all of the pressure uh, for overflowing the water on that spillway. The spillway wasn't wide enough or deep enough to handle the amount of water that was happening. And uh, in addition to that, the dam had been weakened by uh, shoddy repair work over the years when there had been erosion that had taken place, all things that should have been done for an earthen dam. So in the end, that neglect uh, and that lack of repairs that needed to be done and the changes that were made uh, to accommodate the hunting and fishing club all directly led to a disaster that took over 2,000 lives that day.
At 4.07 p.m. on the afternoon of May 31st, 20 million tons of water came crashing through the valley that you see directly behind me uh, and into the city of Johnstown. It was almost an hour after the dam had first collapsed, 14 miles upstream. And estimates of the wave uh, tell us that it was about 40 feet high and moving at about 40 miles an hour. And unfortunately, it was not just water. It was the, the millions of pounds of debris that had been picked up along those 14 miles, including uh, from homes and villages and a factory along the way. And that just picked up everything that it ran into here. Uh, people were seen running for high ground as best they could, but there really was no escaping, no warning. Uh, some people had tried to warn the city, but very little could be done. And uh, dozens and then eventually hundreds of uh, structures were just completely destroyed and carried into the side of the hill that I'm standing on now. And as it crashed into the hill, then it turned and begin, began to go downstream and got caught in a bridge, which I'll visit, visit here in just a few minutes. But just must have been an awful, awful scene from up here looking down helplessly on what was happening in the city of Johnstown that afternoon. After the floodwaters had crashed through the city of Johnstown, they came through to the other side and the water, the wave, which was 30 feet high at this point, slammed into the hillside behind me and then settled over into this stone bridge, which is actually one of the very few remaining structures that existed on May 31st, 1889. And so it didn't take a direct hit. And so the, the bridge survives, but the waters settled up against that bridge and tried to run through there, but so much debris had clogged that it formed a, a wall that actually rose 15 feet above the bridge. And all the debris just started stacking up right there. Parts of houses, parts of other buildings, railroad cars, the uh, uh, barbed wire from the factory downstream or upstream. And uh, eventually, and very tragically, one of the most horrific scenes of the the flood that day happened here at this bridge as that debris caught fire and burned for three days because there was oil and all this material and eventually the remains of 300 people were found burned and charred some of them completely cremated who knows how many bodies disappeared altogether uh, but right here in front of this bridge eventually the waters continued to run down past the bridge and hundreds more people died on the other side of the bridge, but one of the, the most horrific scenes of the entire day of the flood happened right here at the Stone Bridge.
I'm now in Grandview Cemetery, which sits atop a hill overlooking the city of Johnstown. And it's here that approximately half of the victims of the Johnstown flood lie buried today. It's impossible to walk more than a few feet without seeing uh, the date, May 31st, 1889, on a stone. Right here is just one such stone. It's Elizabeth, the wife of James King, and then Edgar, Katie, and James, their children. And they all have the date, May 31st, 1889. I can look just behind me and see two more graves that have the date, May 31st, 1889, and they're all over the place. There are about 500 known graves uh, with names that bear that date, May 31st, 1889, here in Grandview Cemetery. But Grandview is also the final resting place for nearly 800 unknown victims of the flood. They were initially buried all in a mass grave because of fear, uh, a very reasonable fear of disease that could spread quickly. So the, the bodies were rounded up, put in a mass grave. About five months later, uh, they dug up uh, all of those bodies from the mass grave in hopes of identifying more of them. And the ones who eventually were not identified were brought here to Grandview uh, and placed in a mass grave. Let's go take a look.